uh, this sermon is entitled, Lest We Forget. Um, it will take two parts. Uh, one, the first part will be my uh, testimony, which I haven't given uh, publicly before, and I, I pray that you'll bear with me. Um, and the second part will actually get into specifically what that is. There is some crossover there, and I, hopefully you'll see it. Uh, then we'll finish, we'll listen to a song, and then I'll finish with prayer. Okay. My story. Um, I'm 55 years old. Um, up until three and a half years ago, I didn't know what a Seventh-day Adventist was. Really, I didn't know that, what that was. Uh, when I was born, I was not born into a Christian family. Um, and taking it from the other end, it's only been the last five years that uh, I know that in my entire life, I've actually been seeking for the Lord, but didn't realise it. Um, as you can t- probably tell from the accent, I'm from New Zealand. Oh, that gets a bigger laugh, does it, my joke? Excellent. Oh, is that where we're at? Okay. Right. Nice. Um, all my life I felt I'd been seeking meaning and to fill an emptiness in my life. Can anyone sort of relate to that? The younger people, perhaps? Yeah? Okay, great. Because um, that, that, that sort of took me on a journey of trying to find how I could fill that emptiness and find where I had some meaning uh, in my life. And as you'll see, I, I found my work, I made my work my life and that sort of thing. Um, and also I was seeking somewhere in this world I belonged. Because, uh, yeah, my family that I grew up in was not a close-knit family. Um, and it's, it, it just, and no disrespect to either of my parents. My dad's passed away and my mum, they were... They couldn't give what they didn't have. Um, I realise that now. Growing up, of course, I was very self-absorbed and didn't understand that, and I became the person that I am through choices that I made. Uh, Some background, I I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, as I said. Um, My parents, um, unfortunately, didn't get on. Um, I became aware as a in my teens, that uh, in fact I was an accident, but they chose, as it was the, I was going to say custom, um, they chose to stay together because of the children. Unfortunately, that um, it was, albeit it was a, effectively a marriage, it was a loveless one, and there was no love uh, either for the children. I was the eldest of three boys. Um, when I think back to my childhood, I was uh, uh, quite a sensitive young lad, a very outgoing, a sporty, that sort of thing. And it sort of covered that side of things, but I was very conscious um, of what people may have to say about me. And it was through getting knocked around, not physically, but through the knocks of this life that I um, developed a thick skin to sort of deal with it. Um, I certainly was, um, well, my, well, my dad was there, uh, he wasn't present, um, and I was underfathered, which I know just through my own experience, we'll get onto this shortly um, as a policeman, but it is a common thread throughout our society of our children of being underfathered um, and or underparented, really. And no disrespect to you ladies either, but children need the bearing of their fathers as well, just to complete them. So that they, for me, about relationships, um, you know, you know I, I said that I was an accident. I know that it's not in God's plan that I was an accident, that I'm here for a reason. Um, but at the time, I didn't know that. So that's what I was sort of dealing with. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I quickly learned that if I kept to myself, I didn't get into trouble. Um, I wasn't particularly bright at school. I wasn't a dummy, but um, I knew I didn't, I didn't think I had the wits to get to university. I'm not university trained. I got a job. Um, all this without any involvement with God at all in my life. Um, I, went, uh, I joined the army for three years. I, I thought I had... Um, a few rough edges that I thought that um, 
they would sort of square away. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just sort of fell into it. After three years, I got bored with it. Um, and then I ended up joining the police, New Zealand police, which I kept with them for 30 years. Um, but I changed a couple of times, different jobs in that time. My first encounter with, um, with God, but not really seeking him, was um, just socially going to a, um, um, belong to a youth, um, a church youth group. Um, but I, if I'm really honest with you, it was just so that I could meet ladies. Um, and uh, that nothing eventuated from there. I, I didn't feel any, I, I can't think of any time where I was compelled to seek the Lord greatly then. I, a very self-absorbed, um, strong-willed, strong-minded, and very, um, yeah. yeah. It, it was a matter of me surviving, if I can put it that way. Uh, I was a thinker, always very quiet, but I was always thinking about things that, um, and, but I was also foolish. And I say foolish because I, having read Proverbs about people that, blurt out everything, or they say things at appropriate time. I'm thinking, man, that's got me written all over it. Or have I changed? Or have to change when I first read it. Okay, so let's fast track. I'm 30 years in the, um, starting in the police. Um, I effectively made the job my life. That was who I was. Someone said, oh, what do you do? I'm a cop. And then people have this idea. Okay, this is Carl. He's a cop. He's like this. And I was very happy with that for them. I never really had very a lot of close relationships as a as a result of the, what I was exposed to in my life. Now, don't get me wrong, my um, I wasn't exposed to any um, abuse, physical abuse. Certainly, I got a hiding when I deserved it, and that was more than I would have liked. But I certainly deserved it. Um, I wasn't sexually abused or anything like that. Um, um, it's just the environment that I grew up in that it lacked love. What I understood was actually love. Um, and I didn't know how to love as a consequence. Um, okay, so I joined the police 30 years, five years just on the street as a, a normal young cop would do. Uh, then I decided I wanted to specialise, so I um, uh, joined uh, the, the SWAT equivalent um, New Zealand, in New Zealand uh, for 10 years. So I just applied myself to that, got fit, and did what I did, and again, that was just me. And my life revolved around me doing that work. And I loved my job. And uh, I had no time for anything else. Any relationships I had, they knew that this was me. And yep, you can come in and spend time with me, but this is me. Very selfish. Boy. I, uh, yeah. Um, I got to the age of 40. Then I... Um, I wanted to do something a little bit different, uh, so I um, went to the, um, uh, got selected and trained for, or trained up for the uh, Diplomatic and Witness Protection Program in New Zealand, um, and spent 15 years with them, and it was the last, my last job when I left from the police last year. Okay, age 50, it's five years ago. My whole life had just been travelling along uh, I've been filling my life with um, still trying to find or fill that emptiness inside me, not thinking to look for God. Uh, um, I was respectful of people. I, you know, I, I couldn't be a policeman without being that. I, I hated, I cringed when I heard people being prejudiced in the job, realising that um, you know, we, we're supposed to serve the community that we have. But I faltered on that myself. And... Uh, so, yeah, um, five years ago, a friend said, look, hey, why don't you come to church? And, uh, and I thought, okay, why not? She, she was a nice girl. I'd known her for a few years, and I, I accepted an invitation. It was to an Anglican church. And um, so I decided to apply myself to it. And I, every Sunday I'd go and uh, sit down and listen to the sermon. I'd go, oh, okay, yeah, very good. Um, but I knew there had to be more to, more to a life than just an hour and a half on a Sunday. Um, so I um, started... Is, is anyone familiar with the, the course called the Alpha Course? Does anyone know that? You do? Great. Excellent. 
Um, Alpha course, I, I like, it's a, like secular Christianity 101, if I can put those two, if I can be so barbaric to put those two words together. Um, it, it, it was really instrumental in leading me because being a thinker, I, I was not really connected to my heart and it allowed me to spend time with other like-minded or people that were seeking as well where over a period of seven or ten weeks we'd, we'd spend a meal together, watch a DVD and discuss what we saw. And what the information that was given to us was secular evidence and some biblical um, of who the Lord Jesus was or who Jesus was. And then you're left at the end of it thinking, you know, he had to be who he said he was, the Son of God. And for me, that, to get to that point was huge. I, did, I just, I'm thinking, I didn't really grasp the fullness of that. I'm thinking, okay, so he's the Son of God, then there is a God, and now, so what? And I'm thinking, okay, around that time, now I'm going to get on to, how is this? How are we going for time? You're joking me. All right, we got to 1A. <laughs> this crowd's warming up. That's a bigger laugh than I had uh, when I first started. I should have told my joke again, see how I get on there. No. <clears throat> okay. What did I, what did I get up to? Elf course. Sorry? 50. Yes, I was. What happened then? Oh, yes, is, um, that's where I was. Uh, we, we have a TV channel in New Zealand called First Light. Does anyone know that channel? You, excellent. Okay. Uh, I'd been watching it for about four months. Didn't even realise it was a Seventh Day Adventist uh, TV channel. <laughs> it was only until I watched the credits after one of the documentaries that said, um, set in Philadelphia, Seventh Day Adventist Church. I'm thinking, what's that about? Anyway, I listened to a young David Asherick, Doug Batchelor, Walter Fife, um, Stephen Bohr. I was just lapping all this up. And I, it wasn't even a hard sell for me because I had been going to the Anglican church for sort of 18 months by that stage. And I was thinking, yeah, okay. And I, the Sabbath commandment wasn't even a hard sell to me. It wasn't like I was... I then started to question, well, why do they attend on Sunday? And I, I couldn't... And it sort of all sort of fell into place. Around that time that I found out it was a seven-day Adventist church, I was out driving somewhere on a different errand doing something, and I came across, um, unbeknownst to me what it was at the time, but it was a seven-day Adventist church in Royal Oak. And I thought, boy, this is spooky, because I'd only just found out. So I thought, right, I'm committing to going to this church Saturday morning. So I rolled up there. And uh, I sort of sheepishly came to the door, and there was someone much like Paul, but a, a young lady, a, an elderly woman, actually, name, her name is Julie. I don't think she's even quite five foot. And she says, Hello. I says, Hi. She says, Very welcome, please come in. So I did. Um, it was communion service. Um, I wasn't aware of the foot washing ceremony, of course, at that stage. So, and I thought, Okay, everyone's sort of splitting up. Alrighty, what's going on here? So I was still a little bit sheepish about what, um, what was sort of involved. But I, I tell you, when I did follow the men and saw what went on, I, I don't recall it succinctly, but it was like, man, what a humbling experience that was. And I, I committed, I said, look, this, this is the place for me. I had never seen, you know, you see an elderly gentleman washing the feet of a young man and then doing it, you know, reciprocating the same gesture, we we miss um, we miss that in our society. We are so busy, so dense. Um, but for us to come back to us as fellow men um, and being able to do that for each other and just say, "Look, this is who you are. This is how much I respect you. This is the example that the Lord has given us, and I am prepared to do this for you." And then reciprocate it is. Um, it's a huge thing, um, especially for someone who didn't really learn how to love. Um, okay, so I went, uh, I never stopped going to the Royal Lake uh, Seven Day Adventist Church. In August 2015, I was baptised after having gone through the Secrets of Prophecy uh, Bible studies. Um, I don't think there were any blips. Either. The only thing was me delaying my baptism. I, um, I had this in my mind that I wasn't ready until I read, um, reread uh, Steps to Christ again. And Alan White said, um, 
in relation to Jeremiah 23 about can an Ethiopian change the colour of his skin or the leopard's spots. And I knew then that, uh, well, I'm delaying the inevitable. I, I need to, you know, submit to the Lord. Um, so I did. Um, boy, this way. I can't believe the time's flying when you're having fun. That's good. Um, okay. How do we get to a... Uh, well, yeah, some of you all know, being a bi- Bible worker, um, the four of us that are here, we did the Arise course um, earlier this year, and then we asked if we could or got head under to do it. Um, I came to do a rise because uh, after 30 years in the New Zealand police, I decided I've had enough. I want to do something. I committed to the Lord. I must admit, being a um, Seventh-day Adventist for the last three and a half years, probably th- two and a bit of those years, I had been guilty of compartmentalising God. Can anyone relate to that? Probably no one wants to admit that. I see some heads nodding. Um, you could probably say it's very easy for a cop to do that because you know he's got to be focused and doing that. But I think it's a tendency that we can all perhaps do and not. Um, um, excuse me, give me a drink. I was very guilty of that. Anyway, I knew that um, I got to 55. I could either find a job within the police for another 10 years and see out my retirement, or I could be lay it out and just say, no, I wasn't going to do something for the Lord. So I chose the latter. Um, a friend of mine says, have you thought about doing a rise? I looked at the video and thought, why? I don't know. Um, there's a lot of young people that attend that uh, course. And then right at the end of the video, there was some 62-year-old. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, right, I'm in. As it turned out, I wasn't the eldest on the course. Um, I think Tony might have had that uh, privilege of being the uh, elderly gentleman. Um, but it was a wonderful thing for me to do. It got me a chance also to spend time with the millennials, which, um, um, yeah, which in itself was a different take on things. But anyway... Um, So then I asked to do this because I really, there was a lot of information pumped into us and I really needed to apply what I'd been taught and uh, and now I've had the privilege for these last, I've only been here two months to to apply that. Okay, that's my uh, testimony. Probably needs a bit of work. There's no laughter, but that's okay. Hey, um, thank you. Okay. Right, we're going to quickly get through this. Um, Amina, sorry, what time do we have till roughly? Doesn't matter? Okay. Sorry? (laughs) Okay. Um, We've got a little bit of laughter when you found out I was a Kiwi and that sort of thing. And it's very easy for us to think of uh, Australians and uh, Kiwis and we start thinking, oh, yeah, we can beat you in sport and some are good at and some we're not. Oh, we should keep that close, eh? Um, but I thought, um, because I thought the majority of the people that would be away would be the younger generation and there would be more senior people here, and I say that most respectfully. Um, so I thought, what actually binds us together? When, it, when actually will we side by side? And you have to go back before even Agnes was born, to 1915, when we were deployed together as Anzac troops. um, Do people here regularly attend the Anzac Day um, services? Do we have a show of hands? Make a point of doing that? Does everyone here know someone in the family, perhaps, the younger ones, their grandparents or something, who served, have served for Australia? Yeah, okay, I think it is. It's still very relevant, isn't it? Um, so before you start thinking of those things that separate us, that makes us proud nations in our own right. But to highlight that which binds us in, inextricably together, we have to go back to 1915 when Australian and New Zealand troops were first deployed together during World War One. So we have the first slide, uh, Nathan, please. So this is the um, National War Memorial uh, in Wellington. It's the um, Tomb of the Lost Soldier, I think it's uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior, sorry, it's referred to. There's only a few, peop- only a few people that you can see. The second one there is um, you're at Canberra, a few uh, National War Memorial. And our third one we've got is Kingcliff 
only one. Have you seen that one? It's getting a little bit of a face um, facelift uh, at the moment up the front, but they have retained that, so it will be there. But it'll be dressed up a little bit nicer than it is uh, when you see it. Okay, there's nothing quite as moving and special as attending an Anzac Day dawn service. The day we remember all Australians and New Zealanders who served and died in war and in operational service. This day each year is a solemn and reverent affair. Commemorative addresses, wreath laying hymns, uh, the sounding of the last post, observance of one minute silence, the national anthems of both countries. All this takes place on April 25 in both, in both countries. Although the words lest we forget on our monuments are in reference to those men and women who have served and died uh, in the service of their country, the term lest we forget is taken from a poem um, by Rudyard Kipling called Recessional. Was anyone familiar with that? Anyone read poetry here? Excellent. Anyone else read poetry? I don't either. Anyway, we are just... Um, what it is, the phrase lest we forget, if we can just scroll through it, just if you get a chance to read it. Um, I'll give you some background on it. Rudyard Kipling uh, finished the poem in 1897. Uh, he wrote it for Queen Victoria's 60th year uh, reign. The British Empire was the supreme, uh, or they, they thought very highly of themselves um, in and around the world. Um, but he wrote this as a very... Um, is something we, uh, that they should very much consider. The term, lest we forget, is repeated eight times throughout the five stanzas of the um, particular um, poem. speaker calls out to God, the Lord of their battle line under whose hand they hold power over the land. He calls for the Lord God of hosts to be with them, lest they forget. Goes through there. Under there. The speaker of the poem is, is asking God to keep watch over them, um, but for the people not to forget who he is. All right. Um, if you have your Bibles, could we please open it to uh, Deuteronomy 6, that's chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. The term, lest we forget, actually is taken from, um, it's, a, it's accepted that it's taken from Deuteronomy 6, uh, chapter 10, verses Sorry, chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. And it reads, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. A bit of context with this verse. The book of Deuteronomy was written by Moses for the new generation. They've already spent 40 years in the wilderness Moses is 120 years old. He's aware or been told by God that he's not passing over with the new generation, that Joshua takes him from there. So he, in the book he reiterates, the book of remembrance, he reiterates all that he's written before to make sure they're very clear. How does this apply to us today? Um, Very easy uh, when you think of uh, children um, with their families. They, it's very tough for them this day and age to uh, leave home, to get their own property, to roll on, to do what they've got to do. 
Um, if they haven't, um, if, if there's no, shall we say, uh, financial assistance, if you like, from their parents, it's very hard for them to start their own lives. Um, it certainly is the case in New, in New Zealand. Is, would that be expected here as well? Financially, I'm just the housing market alone is something which um, my generation didn't experience that. It was a reasonable thing that a, um, a New Zealander get a job for, say, for a few years, he'd get a deposit and he'd be able to start his own life. But this, really, it's blowing all out of control. So how does this link back to this? That's a good question. Um, Often we, um, and I link this to my own life, the things that we can't have that we want to have at that time, um, we fill our lives with stuff. I talked about an emptiness that I had in my life. Um, I brought stuff. Or I had relationships that, uh, until the honeymoon period was over, um, it served a purpose in filling that emptiness that was inside me. When the honeymoon period was over, um, there was a reason to uh, leave that relationship, I thought. Um, I didn't know what love was. Um, I didn't know how to show love selflessly, if you want. It was uh, always motiv motivated by a self-interest otherwise. Um, OK. I just want to wrap this up now, if I can. I've sort of lost myself a little bit. I just want to uh, end on two quotes, if I may. First um, is from our own Alan White, um, where we need to uh, think and not, not forget God. Um, it's very easy to say that we pray to God and that sort of thing, but we should consider him in every aspect of our lives. So if we could finish that quote, please. Second to last quote. In reviewing our past history, I am filled with astonishment, as with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Okay. Um, just on that last quote, um, that's a very famous one that's often repeated. Is that, um, that, are you guys familiar with that? You are. Okay. Um, and that maybe the lesson there for us is that we, in our own personal lives, um, how the Lord has led us, albeit for me, for the last five years, although when we get to heaven, he'll probably tell me, Carl, I had my eye on you right from the start, and these are the times that I tried, but you just ignored me. Um, so I, yeah, I would ask that you uh, consider your own, how you've got to this part, and realise really think about how the Lord has led you to where you are now. We'll finish on uh, this last quote, if you could. Another, Oswald Chambers. Does anyone know that name? Has anyone read his work? Oswald Chambers. He, he wrote um, My Utmost for his, his Highest. His Highest? Yeah, My Utmost for His Highest. Um, we'll just get on to that quote now. We are in danger of forgetting that we cannot do what God does, and God will not do what we can. We cannot save nor sanctify ourselves. God does that. But God will not give us good habits or character, and he will not force us to walk correctly before him. We have to do that ourselves. We must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, which God has worked in us. We must get into the habit of doing things. In the initial stages, that is difficult. And I've thrown in the David North challenge, for some of you that, um, that may have found it that way. What is the test that we have created the right habit? If when a crisis comes, we instinctively turn to God, we will know then that the right habit has been formed in us. Lest we forget. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us this past week. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'll be with us throughout this new week that comes that you will create divine appointments for us, that we may be able to reflect Jesus to others. Lord, 
We pray that we do not forget you, that when we walk past our monuments and we see the words, lest we forget, we know the true meaning of that, that we're not to forget you, that we're to surrender all our lives to you, each compartment. Be with us now, Lord, as we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.